So one of the most exciting things for us in the MS community was in 2017 when we got our first approved therapy for progressive disease. So tell us a little bit about where we are now, Jamie, with progressive disease. Uh, so uh, it's true, ocrelizumab was approved for primary progressive uh, disease based on the strength of a, a phase three randomized uh, controlled trial. And uh, in fact, uh, in, in, in sort of the approval process is another uh, drug, saponamod, which uh, showed successful trial results in secondary progressive MS. Uh, they both um, had, uh, I would say, a similar uh, reduction in the proportion of patients uh, hitting the progression metric uh, as we define it by the, e the EDSS or you know, the Expanded Disability Status Scale. Um, and I would say, um, the, uh, which is a reduction of about 24% uh, uh, compared to placebo, which is a start. I mean, it's, it's better than we could do before, and so that's, it's good. Uh, of course, we would like to see better uh, results for our patients than that, um, and uh, I think that's a, a sort of a, a broad overview. So, so, Tom, let me ask you this. So, fingolimod in the INFORM study, which was a really good clear-cut study that clearly was negative for primary progressive disease. Why do you think saponimod, which is next generation, right, S1P1, succeeded, albeit modestly, in secondary progressive disease? So that's an age-old question, right? That goes back to uh, the interferons where a European trial uh, in uh, secondary progressive MS was positive and then a US trial was negative. So it is that some things that we potentially don't fully understand at this point in time may actually help us. Uh, obviously, siponimod also has certain receptor specificities that fingolimod doesn't have. So there is one argument would be that the distinction in the uh, S1P receptors that are actually targeted could have caused this. The other thing is obviously that uh, what we really control with Siponi mode is still an inflammatory component of the disease and with that inflammation drives disability and that's really what we are looking at. Uh, I mean, it raises also the issue that both uh, that essentially a S1P uh, receptor agonist, antagonist and an anti-CD20 molecule have some effect in progressive forms of MS. Uh, is it then that actually the immune mechanism still play a significant role in, in, in this particular condition and also in primary progressive MS? So if I would have to put down my chips today, I think that what this controls is the inflammatory component of these states and it's not what was referred to as a true neuroprotective component, so meaning helping previously injured or currently injured neurons to survive longer. I don't think that either fingolim uh, sorry, siponimod or ocrolizumab actually do that. I think they control the residual inflammatory activity. But at least siponimod enters the CNS. Yeah. And the anti-CD20 really doesn't, less than 0.1%. So if you're going to have a direct effect, at least siponimod in theory gets in there. Well, that was the hope for fincolimod and informs. Maybe, maybe you know? it is the fact that some of the receptors are bad in the CNS. So that, that would be so S1P4, effect. right? Yes. So I have a different take on this whole conversation. Okay. So if you look at the ocrelizumab clinical trial as primary progressive, and you look at the proportion of patients who had GAD-enhancing lesions at entry into the trial, and you look at what happened with informs, which had maybe 13, 14% GAD enhancement, and the um, ocrelizumab trial had like 25 or 26%. And then you, you take the group of patients who did not have GAD enhancing lesions in the ocrelizumab trial, they didn't do as well as the ones who did have GAD enhancing lesions. So I think it's a, as Tom points out, that it's an inflammation effect. And I think the failed trial with, um, with INFORMS was really driven by the lack of inflammatory patients in that trial versus the ones 
who do have information. That's my take on the but whole But the problem situation. is the subset analyses don't give us enough information. You're right. There's a trend to difference in yeah. the response between those who had got a baseline and those who didn't. But the numbers are too small to they be are significant. Too small. It's true. And the subset analyses of the saponimode study didn't give you enough information either. You know, the subsets Again, all numbers. showed a therapeutic yeah. effect. I would add another thing that I think is interesting because uh, just published this month, there was a look in a consortium in Europe looking at uh, rituximab in a second progressive population in, uh, in the trial population was similar to in forms and showing an effect. So I think that's an interesting little piece to all this uh, too. And so I, I, I tend to agree that I think it's more related to inflammation. We don't really know. Another thing that I think is very complicated about all this is, you know, I think the fundamental question is what is progressive disease? I don't think, I, I, I don't feel comfortable saying that I could say exactly what's happening. And in fact, I would make the argument that it may be a little different for different people. You know, that some patients may have more of an inflammatory component, others may have less, and so you may have better opportunity with some uh, than others. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, this issue about compartmentalization is an interesting one, but uh, I think uh, now we're starting to understand that uh, B cells are traversing uh, sort of more uh, into the central nervous system than we uh, thought and so what you do in the periphery uh, certainly does affect things. Um, so it's it's complicated um, and uh, um, uh, you know I'm glad that we've had some positive effects but uh, um, you know I, I think it's uh, I, I just I guess fundamentally I worry that a lot of what you see with progressive disease is dialed in from things that happened long ago which again I think makes an argument for more effective therapies up front. Well, it could be also that uh, there is something different about the SP, S1P5 um, function in uh, sipinamide versus uh, fingillamide, um, particularly in its effect on myelination oligodendrocytes. But they both modulate P5. They both, but there could be more avidity, let's say, or more oh, S1P5 okay. effect with sipinamide. I mean, remember, the clinical effect was in the range of 20%. Only. Yeah. So maybe a CNS effect could be related to that. 